Uh, good morning. Um, it's my honor to uh, introduce Alita Bundy, who's a research scientist at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. Uh, Alita's research interests include the impact of fishing on marine ecosystems, the structure and functioning of ecosystem, ecosystem-based management, um, ecosystem-based indicators of fishing impacts, development of assessment methods for data-poor fisheries, and adaptive management of fisheries. She's uh, currently on the Ember Steering Committee where she chairs the Human Dimensions uh, Working Group. So let's give a, Alita a hand. Uh, thank you, Mike, and good morning, everyone. Um, oh, good, there's my presentation. All right. Um, so across North America, lots of people wake up in the morning and read cartoons. So I thought it might be nice to start this day with a cartoon and make sure everyone's awake and have a little bit of touch of humor to, to start us off. In addition, I don't know how many of you know the Sherman's Lagoon cartoon by Jim Toomey, but it takes place in a cartoon Sorry, it takes place in a lagoon, and the main character is Sherman, who's uh, the shark over here, and he's a bit dense, he's slow, you know, they're long-lived creatures, and they kind of move slowly, don't do too much, but even he's picked up on the idea that there's something weird going on with the ocean, so he, he says to the little fish, who's called Ernest, and he's bright, because he's got a computer, and he says, everyone's freaking out over some kind of ocean solidification, and Ernest turns to him and says, acidification, ocean acidification, that's it. And then Ernest goes on to explain to Sherman that about a third of all CO2 emissions are absorbed by the ocean, which affects us all. And then Sherman, you know, in his kind of slow thinking way, thinks, maybe I can blame my golf scores on it. And, then, and Ernest replies, oh, you're running out of excuses. The point of this is that in the first three panels of this cartoon, they've explained to people all over North America that there's an issue going on with the oceans. This is an example of what I think is brilliant communication. Uh, that didn't work. There we go. Um, and then a few days later, Sherman comes back to Fillimore the turtle, who's also quite bright. He's got a book and says, I did some research on ocean acidification. It's really bad for plankton, the poor little guys. And they produce over half of all the oxygen that the beach apes, that's us, need to breathe. So Sherman says to Fillmore, aren't you going to say anything? Well, I'm still processing the fact that I did some research. So what this cartoon does too, it interconnects the things that are happening in the oceans right through to the humans, which is us, of course. And what we're talking about a lot in this conference is about research. And what I'm going to talk about today uh, in this presentation is about how we need to integrate both humans and nature into our science, our research, into our management, and into our governance. Now, as you'll have told from uh, Mike's introduction, uh, I'm a natural scientist, talking about the integration of human and, uh, sorry, social and natural sciences. Now, uh, if I was a social science, I might, scientist, I might say I'm talking about integrating the social and the asocial sciences, which is a different perspective. And that kind of underscores some of the differences between us. So, we're dealing with a lot of things. Whoops, this doesn't. There we, oops, now I've gone too far. Hold on. All right, just to uh, give you a sense of, of where I'm going to go for the next 40 minutes or so, um, we need to talk about the role of humans. As a, uh, we know they're the cause of all our problems, we need to talk about how they can also be the solution. Uh, but there are challenges in that, and I want to talk about some of those. And then talk about some of the experiences I've had um, as a natural scientist trying to do interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research uh, with my social science colleagues. And then also, if I have time, touch on that we also need to be innovative in the way we think about our science. And so these here are just some of the uh, uh, themes that we have in this conference, and they all reflect the multiple pressures and stressors our oceans and systems are under, and some of the approaches and the uh, challenges that we need to address. And I would argue that all of this requires incorporating the human dimensions. Um, we've heard a bit already about the fact that, that fisheries are, if you like, our exemplar of crises. Uh, we've heard, you know, uh, some suggestion that things are improving in some places of the world. Writ large, fisheries are still in crisis. And 
we've known why for at least 10 to 14 years, probably longer than that. There's a whole range of issues, what's wrong with global fisheries, but it basically it comes down to governance. And by governance, we mean the way we govern our fisheries, the management of peoples and human behavior. So it's a profit-driven industry. It's um, um, largely done, or historically done by top-down management. We have global markets, high demand for food, competing interests, conflicting objectives, fisheries subsidies, inappropriate sensitives, destructing fishing practices. You can read down the list. And of course, poverty is also a driver for, ship for uh, overfishing too. But it's not just governance. Uh, I think at the scientific level, we also uh, have not always provided the best advice. Um, we, we've had this sort of hegemic single species view for, for decades. And one could argue that if we'd had more of an ecosystem multi-species view, we may be in a different place. And we've also, for decades, got, uh, lived in this paradigm of the fact that we should be favoring um, selectively fishing uh, larger species, and perhaps we need to revisit that too. So there's lots of reasons. So on top of our fisheries crisis, of course, we now have all the challenges of global warming, ocean acidification, etc. And I don't need to tell you about that. I think we're all aware of what's going on there. So we need a change, and this has already been recognized by the uh, International Social Science Council in their report last year, where they actually argue that social science needs to be at the heart of understanding and responding to global challenges, such as climate change, pollution, resource limits, and planetary boundaries. So we now have not only, I don't know about you, but all the science conferences I've been to for the last 20 years, there's a cry, out, hey, we need social scientists to work with us. Now the social scientists have also come out with a statement saying, we need to work with the natural sciences. So I think that's an advance. We now have a recognition of both sides, the need to work together. The question is, how do we do that? So I would argue that traditionally, it's been driven by the natural sciences, and we've got quite good at working with one another. You know, we mix uh, physical oceanography with biological oceanography, and even now in our end-to-end -end modeling, link that up with uh, higher trophic levels. Um, but when we include the social sciences, it's more like we're putting the icing on top of the cake. And if we've got some policy in there, there's a cherry. So it's, it's really like more of an afterthought. Social scientists are often invited to join natural science projects as a, as a as sort of when the projects had already started. So the argument I would make to you is that um, the social scientists and natural scientists need to work together and be integral to the design. So it needs to be more of a tiramisu where all these different aspects are combined right from the beginning and are integral to the overall design. Um, so the challenge for both social and natural scientists is to fully engage in a, a transdisciplinary approach to our research. And transdisciplinary means integrating across disciplines. So th the, uh, there's a nice paper, recent paper by Chianelli et al, where they, um, no, I do have to turn around, you see? Okay, so where we have sort of our, our different disciplines, biology, economics, and social, and they differentiate between multi and interdisciplinary, where um, they, d they define a problem and share methods, but the policy solution is done separately, whereas in a transdisciplinary approach, all actors together define the problem, share the methods, and define the policy solution. So transdisciplinary is everyone's in there from the start, recognize the problem, define how to approach it. Uh, so we need to place our work in uh, this larger systems context and to make connections with researchers from other disciplines. And hopefully some of that's happening at this conference. We also need to take a systems thinking approach. And some of you will, will be aware of, of this idea that we need to think of our systems as a sort of coupled social and natural systems. And there's, there's different terminology out there. The more popular one at the moment seems to be social ecological systems. But they all amount to the same thing, is that we have to look at our natural systems and the, and the connections that they have with our social sex, uh, systems and the connections within. And this is a diagram from Eleanor Ostrom. It's, it's quite old now, but basically just showing uh, what, what this means in reality. But what I'm going to show you, so the focus is on the interactions between these different components. But actually, this is a figure I prefer. Uh, this is a recent figure from the Pisces study group on the social, ecological, environmental systems. Um, and this really just highlights the more complex nature of the, the, the likely interactions. And here the, the uh, focus on, is on coastal hypoxia, but they um, define the different aspects of the marine system, 
different features of the environmental system that are driving the marine system, and then on the human side, marine-based and land-based activity which might be driving the hypoxia, and then the various drivers and responses within this system. So this, of course, is also vastly um, simplified, but it begins to show the complexities of these interconnected systems that we have to consider when we approach our natural resource problems. And to a certain extent, this is old news. Social scientists have been conducting research into social cultural areas for, for decades. Um, Harold Innes, Raymond Firth back in the 50s and 60s, uh, and in the 80s, Jim Akerson, Ken Luddell, Anthony Davis. Pre the social scientists have been interested and involved in fisheries, but it's making that connection with the natural sciences and the policy, which has happened much less. And arguably, n now we recognize all the different aspects that need to come into this picture. And um, there's an edited volume that Ian Perry, um, Eileen Hoffman and I produced as a result of some uh, IMBA work where we have a collective uh, number of papers where we address all these different, uh, different papers address different aspects of this. So this is the idea that we can look from the biogeochemistry right through to the, to the humans to address some of the challenges of managing uh, changing marine social ecological systems. Um, in a recent paper by Hackman et al., they also come back to this point that humans need to be at the center. Um, finding solutions to climate and environmental change requires joint ex efforts of experts from all domains of science, decision makers, and stakeholders. And this makes social science knowledge indispensable and requires leadership from the global, global social science community. So again, we're used to kind of taking the lead in the natural sciences, and Hackman et al are calling for social scientists to take this lead. They're also calling for a, re a reframing of the issue, and reframing it in the sense that the issues at stake put humans at the center of global environmental change. And I think this is a different perspective, although perhaps we know it intuitively from a research perspective, I think that might be a bit challenging for some of us to get our heads around, but perhaps that's where we may make more progress. So also, all that is easier said than done, and there's lots of challenges along the way. Uh, in 2011, Patrick Christie uh, produced a paper, uh, Creating Space for Interdisciplinary Marine and Coastal Research. And, and he, he made the argument that um, you know, natural science basically dominate the, the construction of environmental problems. Um, and we require adequate human financial resources to address these problems. Um, and also, we, we seem to think that, that, that the reason we have the problems is that we have inadequate knowledge to address the problems, inadequate ecological knowledge or physical knowledge, whereas, in fact, I would argue in most of the cases, it's inadequate social knowledge. And he addressed uh, or identified five dilemmas in trying to bring interdisciplinary scientists together. The first, the imbalance of natural and social sciences, which we just discussed. Also, an over-reliance on a particular world view and science policy uh, sort of epistemic uh, community, meaning that, thing, that issues are often driven by agendas, essentially. That's a, that's a euphemism for um, our, our science being driven by different agendas. And that happens both in the social and the natural science communities. We also have different ways of knowing. We have different ways of, of, of working with data, different um, analytical methods, and, so, and different languages. So it can be challenging to work together. Also, balancing um, basically applied and non-applied sciences, and, and social scientists are less used to working in applied science context, but we need to, um, again, find ways to make that happen more successfully. And then uh, we also need to, to find ways to, or have a balance between having global studies, which as we talked about um, yesterday in the, the, the panel about large global projects, those are necessary to understanding what's happening at global level, but that also needs to be balanced with local projects. So further challenges. There's lots of challenges out there. <laughs> Uh, and there was some recent work done by Murray Rudd, who's here at this conference and uh, is presenting a paper tomorrow. Now, I'd encourage you to go to this, his presentation. Uh, he's done a, an analysis of over uh, 2,100 scientists from the natural and uh, social sciences and to identify their research priorities. He provided them with 67 research questions, which he drew from the literature, and asked them to rank these. And as you might imagine, there are some interesting, well, both similarities and differences. 
So here is the top 20 of these questions ranked. This is directly from his paper. And on the, the column to the left, this is the overall score. So the top ranked question was uh, the concerns about cumulative stressors, then ocean productivity, ocean acidification, monitoring cumulative effects, oceanographic data. I, I won't go through the whole list. I refer you to his paper. Um, so these are the top 10 questions, but the top two questions from the social scientists were actually ranked 11 and 20 in this overall list. And then if we look at that in more detail, this is just the top 10 that I've shown you here, ranked by the physical scientists, the ecological scientists, and the social scientists. So one of the questions was ranked highly as in the top 10 by all three groups. So the effects of cumulative stressors. So this is a key research priority identified through this exercise. Um, monitoring cumulative effects was also in the top 10 for the ecological and physical scientists, but I think number 14 under the social scientists. So still we've got some good correspondence there. I'm not, yes, you can see those blue lines, good. So uh, there was much more similarity between the physical and the ecological scientists and much less between the social scientists and the other two groups. Their top ranked uh, priority was science communication. And we've talked about that a bit in this uh, um, conference so far, but communication is key. And then also cross-disciplinary ocean science and management. Both were identified by either of the ecological or, or physical sciences, but neither of them reached the top 10. So this is just to illustrate that we have different perspectives and different uh, priorities in our research. Uh, I think this is my last slide in this matter. Also, uh, Kate Moon and Deborah Blackman have recently produced a guide to understanding social science research for natural scientists. And this is, I, I think, another step forward to help us to try and understand one another. And it's not meant to be discouraging. There's a lot of science and research going on. There's lots of organizations doing this, both at the global scale and at more local scale. Here I've just put a few of the, the, the bigger projects up. Uh, the top four are both terrestrial and marine projects. The, the last two, too big to ignore and low, so I really just focus more on the marine. And all these different projects try to integrate across the human and natural systems. So it is happening. It just needs to happen more and involve more of us. So what I'm going to do now is, is talk to you a little bit about the, some of my specific experiences with some of the interdisciplinary work that I've been involved in, uh, in the Indices Project, the IMBA Project, and uh, the IUCN Fisheries Expert Group. So Indices, some of you may be aware of it. Um, the, the intent of Indices is to assess the status of exploited marine ecosystems around the world. It's global in scope. And we like to think of it as being regionally rich because for each of the ecosystems that are part of this project, we have experts for that from that ecosystem as part of the research project. And so it's not simply a top-down meta-analysis where we grab all the data and interpret it with that local expertise. The locals are very much part of that interpretation and the definition of the research questions that we have. Um, you'll notice that there's a bit of a gap you know, on the eastern side of that plot. And so clearly we're not quite global in scope and certainly are always interested in uh, bringing in more case studies. Uh, we, excuse me, oops, there you go. Uh, the project started in 2005. Um, the first phase ended in 2009. In that first phase, it was purely an ecological project. We developed a suite of ecological indicators, applied them to the, I think, 19 or 23 ecosystems that we had at that stage and produced our results, published papers, et cetera. As a result of that, that work, we recognized that we had some gaps. Um, and before I move on to that, I just want to recognize uh, the two co-leads of this, uh, Yun Shin and Lin Shannon. And Lin Shannon's here uh, as part of this conference. So please come up and talk to either one of us if you're interested in the Indices project. But looking at the results of the, the first part, looking at ecological indicators only, um, we did various types of analyses, and when we looked at all those analyses together, we found that for five of those systems, they were very clearly degraded based on our ecological indicators. Another four of those systems seemed to be improving, and this is over like a 20, 25 year period. And then the others at the bottom of that list, uh, we had mixed signals. Some of the indicators seemed to be decreasing, others were increasing. 
And when we looked uh, and incorporated some other drivers from the environment and human-driven drivers, we saw that for these s systems which had more mixed signals, actually seemed to be affected uh, by both human, significant uh, relationships between both human and environmental drivers, suggesting that there's much more going on than simply fishing. So that instigated the, the, our next phase of research uh, where we look at multiple drivers. And here the human dimensions were clearly identified. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, just the, the work we've done within the human dimensions working group. And so this was a working group with both natural and social scientists, so interdisciplinary in that sense. A small working group, I should say. Um, and we defined four goals that we'd want to achieve in order to have a, sort of a good social and um, so social, uh, sorry, good human dimension status of the eco eco ecological ecosystems. So the first one was to assess the effectiveness and efficiency of management and quality of governance. The second was to assess the contribution of fisheries to the broader society. And the third to assess well-being and resilience of fisher communities. Uh, to assess the first goal, we developed a survey questionnaire which actually was based on some earlier work done by Tony Pitcher et al. assessing uh, how well countries uh, complied with the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, but we adapted it to our own needs, reduced the number of questions, made them more objective, and um, defined that we needed evidence to support any claims of, of um, sorry, the, sort of, uh, evidence in support of the responses to the questions we asked. And then we did various forms of analysis, uh, PCAs, multivariate analysis, et cetera. But just to quickly show you some of these results, this is uh, simply ranked on the sum scores. And I, I realize that you can't understand what all these systems are, but basically those to the left, yes, left, the blue ones are Australia, Northwest US, Barents Sea, Northeast US, West Coast Vancouver Island, Chatham Island from New Zealand. So these are all systems from our more developed countries, if you like. To the right, the darker blue, are Madagascar, uh, Catalan Sea, Guinea, Inner Ionian Sea, so a mixture of countries from the African states and from the Mediterranean. So we have a spectrum here of um, management effectiveness and, and quality of governance. Um, we then looked at contribution to society and, and well-being, and I, I won't go through all these indicators, but one of the points I want to make here is that one of the challenges in doing integrating natural and social sciences is data availability. And Leanna McManus touched on this yesterday. We're used to having, you know, satellite data showing us what primary production is all over the world. Um, we have Argo sensors all over the oceans. We have fisheries data that, that's collected universally. We have all this data basically at our hands. Whereas when it comes to dealing with social science data, it's much less widely available. And the, the data that is available on a global basis tends to be quite high level and at the national level. So we ended up having to, to compromise and take the, the national data because we were not able to get more specific data at the ecosystem level for all these different systems. And then even then, some of this data wasn't as easy to get as others. So the ones I've highlighted in red here, um, it wasn't possible to get data for every single country. So you're still faced with data challenges. And this is something that we have to recognize, is that there are data differences between the natural and social sciences. Um, and there's also an issue of scale. Um, the, the, our ecosystems can be anything from, from you know, you can think of a, a, a demersal benthic ecosystem with very immobile creatures. And so it can happen at the scale of meters right through to thousands of kilometers. And the processes that affect those systems can happen at those same spatial scales. It's also true of the human systems. Um, and bounding these systems can be challenging. And, and making, those com uh, sorry, making those bounds compatible can also be challenging. So we came across this with our system. So for example, on the west coast of Africa, most of those ecosystems were defined as EEZs. So having macro indicator data at the national level wasn't a problem. Um, but for smaller systems, which are smaller than the EEZ, then how representative are those national data for that specific smaller part of the country? And then for some countries, such as in North America, we had um, systems on the east and west coast, and basically the macro indicator data was the same for both, because we didn't have it at that individual level. 
And then the, the, the opposite is green. We have uh, sort of large marine ecosystems like the North Sea with lots of countries bounding it. And therefore, we have lots of national data, and that has to basically be assembled into one data point using some sort of weighted mean. So this is just to underscore another one of the challenges is difference in scales. And we need to look at these problems from a multi-scale perspective, but it can be challenging to get the right data to integrate across those scales. And this is just to give you an example of some of the results from this. This is from our website. And these are what we call petal point plots. And the length of these petals, uh, basically the bigger the petal, the larger the score. And this is scaled from 0 to 1. So this is showing you the results for management and governance. And just to highlight here, then, you can see that the, the Benguela system, the Scotian Shelf, the West Vancouver, Vancouver Island do best when it comes to management, governance, and effectiveness. But then we look at contribution of fisheries to, to society and well-being. We see the opposite. It's actually the greatest contribution and well-being in the Rufiji Mafia Channel, which is in Tanzania, the Guinea EEZ, and Senegal. So we have a, a lack of correspondence between management effectiveness and governance and the uh, importance of fisheries to society and well-being. And obviously that, that um, result bears further exploration. And so we looked at the uh, combination of the management and governance indicators together with the, uh, the macro indicators for each country and threw them into a principal component analysis. And I know this is all a big jumble, but I'm just going to walk you through it. Um, so this is a multivariate analysis. These um, are, are divided into two basic clusters, um, and the two principal components account for about 60% of the variation. So that's not bad. So basically, these, uh, the systems to the right-hand side of the plot uh, all these, those indicators listed there basically speak to contribution to society and uh, the capacity for adaptation or resilience to change. The uh, systems at the top left-hand side of the plot, and these are again our sort of northeast US, northwest US, Australia, West Vancouver Island, these are all where we see good management effectiveness and quality of governance. And then on the bottom left-hand corner, um, this is a, 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 our part of our well-being indicator. And in this case, uh, th th these are systems which have a negative well-being. This is where fisheries wages are quite low compared to the average wage in the country. And this actually tends to be the countries from the Mediterranean seas, which is another quite interesting result. So this allows us to, to explore the social and human dimensions of these exploited ecosystems and try to understand th the differences between them. And the next step is to integrate this together with our uh, understanding of the ecological status of this system and to come up with an overall global as integrated assessment of the status from the both the natural and human dimensions of these exploited ecosystems. Um, excuse me. However, although we're trying to be global in scope and regionally rich, um, and this does enable investigations, you know, on a broad comparative basis, when it comes to the human dimensions, as I've explained, this is more challenging. At the ecological level, we have experts, uh, as I've mentioned, from each of the country, but we don't have the equivalent suite of experts from our different countries on the social sciences side. So this is another challenge, is to bring in the social sciences, scientists into this project. But what we've discovered is that not, natural scientists don't always know who the social scientists are in their country and who to go to. And this was discussed at an Imber and Beasel meeting uh, about a year and a half ago in Goa, is lots of natural scientists say, well, we don't know who the social scientists are. And so we need to have ways to bring the natural and social scientists together. OK. Oh, and I'm awarding us uh, just a cherry icing with a cherry on top, because we really have not got that full integration of the natural and social scientists at the broader level in this project. Okay, I'm going to move on now to the human dimensions wor work I've been doing within IMBER. IMBER has four research themes, the fourth of which is responses to society. And this is one of these big global, uh, go global change projects, for those of you not familiar with it. Um, so the, the objectives of the, the fourth theme are to promote an understanding of the multiple feedbacks between uh, humans and ocean systems. And... Um, to, to clarify what human institutions can do to try and mitigate these. Uh, I've listed the members of the working group at the bottom of this screen. And then, so this is a very interdisciplinary group. We have economists, people involved in policy, anthropologists, 
uh, natural scientists like myself, all of whom have an interest in working together in an interdisciplinary fashion and representative of the different parts of the world. Um, so what we've done together is to develop um, a decision tool which we're calling Ember Adapt. And we've done this because, as we all know and we've been discussing, global change is happening around us now. But identifying what the most appropriate response to that is remains a challenge. Um, and that's because there isn't really any synthesis of what kind of responses have been tried, what responses have worked and what responses have failed. And so what we're doing is um, building this tool, which we call an assessment based on description, responses, and appraisal for a typology to help guide decision makers, stakeholders, and other users to identify what kind of um, uh, approach might work best for their system given a specific issue. So as I say, it's a decision support tool that builds on knowledge learned from past experience. And we use the term global change. So we're not confined to climate change per se. I think we can learn from how we've responded to other types of global change uh, and to understand what kind of governing mechanisms might work, what kind of social responses might work. And we can apply perhaps lessons learned from other cases to some of the challenges more specific to climate change. And so the idea of this is that, that it will enable decision makers and others to, to triage, you know, basically figure out what's best for them to do in a given circumstances to make decisions efficiently. And importantly, to evaluate where to allocate resources, because resources are scarce everywhere. So rather than have to go out and say, oh, we need to do more research, we might be able to say, oh, based on this, this, and this, it might make sense to... to, to um, try this out in the interim, and then we can build up some um, uh, more details as we, as we go along. Um, we, it relies on contextualized uh, place-based case study, so rich in detail. And again, it's global in reach, but we, we, we try to capture the detail and not just have a very s uh, simple um, analysis because that really won't get us anywhere. And so who will use Ember Adapt? Well, a whole broad suite of people. I mean, really it's aimed at decision makers, but that can be managers, it can be stakeholders, it can be community groups. Um, it can be researchers too who are involved in this work and working, working with these groups. It also can be a useful resource for students down the line as this database grows. Um, students can be using this database to, to um, examine particular patterns, to examine, uh, try and dis sort of do a kind of, again, a kind of meta-analysis to figure out what kind of things are going on where and uh, what kind of responses have worked best in which kind of situations. So it can be a research tool, but most fundamentally, it's a decision-making tool. Uh, theoretical background is, again, on the systems thinking approach, linked social ecological systems. Uh, this is a figure from Ian Perry and Rosemary Omer, who led the Globe Human Working Dimensions group. So we very much worked uh, building on their experiences. This is quite a linear representation of interlinked social ecosystems. I just want to remind you of this more complex variety that we need to consider. Uh, we also build upon the, the driver pressure state impact response framework, which I think you're all familiar with, but also the interactive governance theory. And um, I'm certainly not an, uh, uh, an expert on interactive governance, but it, the theory is that, that um, it's a full exploration of system properties that may uh, contribute to responses. It divides um, into the systems to be governed and the governing systems, and the systems to be governed are both the natural and social systems, and essentially explores the governability of systems. So how, how vulnerable are they? How complex are they? What are the scales of the issues? So it, it really uh, looks at the interactions between different components of the systems and assesses their, their overall governability. So we've taken uh, the, the aspects of the DIPSER and the interactive governance theory and combined them into a um, a framework, which I think you won't find that that's too dissimilar from what you're used to seeing in the DIPSA framework. But so we, we start with an issue, what, what's going on? And then we describe the state of the system in terms of diversity, complexity, dynamics, and scale. We look at the stressors, change, impact, responses. And we look at that from the aspect of the governing, the natural, and the social systems. Now, critically, what we bring to this is an appraisal of these responses. And we use a results-based framework to do this. So we look at the responses and say, okay, what were the objectives of those responses and were they achieved? Was the, the main issue up here, was this addressed? And if so, um, how, how well was it addressed? Were there any side effects? What kind of constraints there were? So we try to learn 
about what the responses were and how effective they were in the given circumstances. And this is the learning tool that will enable others to, to uh, be more effective and efficient in their responses. So the information from the description and appraisal comes from case studies, and we bring that into a typology that then helps the user define how their system relates to the others. And I'll just go over that in a minute. So our, we have a developed questionnaire. There's about 50 questions here asking about, you know, as we just looked at, the description of the stressors and their impacts, the vulnerability of the systems, governance, response, appraisal. Um, interestingly, working within a multidisciplinary working group, and here's another challenge, we found differences in language, we had differences in approaches. At one point, we had about 150 questions. Some of us thought we needed to be incredibly detailed, others thought we need to be much more narrow. And uh, the narrow ones worked out in the sense that we've actually whittled the numbers down over time. But this was part of a negotiation process. And again, part of the difficulties were from dif different disciplinary perspectives. But we were able to work through that over time. So we've been collecting case studies. And uh, we have enough now to basically what I'm going to show you is a prototype typology. Um, the questions that w from the questionnaires are, of course, qualitative in textual format, but we've translated those into basically a, on a categor categorical scale of one to five and use multiple factor analysis to, to examine these. And basically, the 10 case studies can be clustered into to four groups. Um, it doesn't really matter what these are. The point is that, that the, these groups are separated from these groups on the first dimension and then these groups from the top from the second sorry, these on the top from those below on the second dimension. So this is how the case studies are clustered. And now we can also look at how the factors um, define those uh, dimensions. So we have three factors, governability, vulnerability, and response. And what we see here is that governability actually separates our groups out on the basis of the questions that are represented here and the questions represented here. The response questions tend to separate the, uh, the systems on the vertical axis and as do the vulnerability ones. Now this analysis is based on these questions, uh, the, these three factors of governability, vulnerability, and response. And then we map the appraisal results onto this space. And here you can see that the appraisal actually maps onto the, the, the questions about vulnerability, suggesting that the successful of, um, uh, appraisals that are successful seem to be related to the vulnerability of the systems. Um, so in, in terms of sort of reading into that a bit more, I won't go through this in detail. Uh, the point is we can dig into this a bit further, look at which questions were relevant to separating out these systems and beginning to understand what factors of gov governability differentiate the systems on the left and the right and which factors of vulnerability separate those from the top and bottom. This begins to give us information to understand why some responses were successful, why some were not. And then from a user perspective, oops, is that going to work? Yeah, for, oh, sorry. From a user perspective, you know, if you're a stakeholder, a decision maker, and you have a system and you've got problem A with factors B, C, and D, and they relate to, uh, you know, this system here, then you can then go into the, uh, to see what kind of responses were used, uh, how successful they were, what worked, what didn't, and then also go into the database to get that more detailed analysis if it looks like this is relevant to you. So this is a portal, if you like, for decision makers to access the information that's relevant to their situation. So just very quickly, we, our c conclusions from this work is that we, we, the typology does appear to provide a, an opportunity to uh, separate different types of systems into types. We obviously need to build a lot more case studies to fully develop this, but this is really just a, a pilot example of how this could work. As I say, the typology is a first order entry point which takes us to the more detailed database underneath. Um, interestingly, in the case studies we've collected to date, many of the responses for um, what the short-term response was supposed to say we need to do more research. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to confront with this is to say, well, if we already know what kind of things may work and may not, the first short-term response may not need to be more research. Maybe, yes, we can do A or B, and then meanwhile do further research to, to think about what might be the longer-term response. So our next steps are to um, obviously to continue to apply and test this. We also want to work more directly with stakeholders uh, and collect more case studies. So I have a pamphlet here which I'll distribute in the 
poster area, but also if anyone wants one, please come and see me. And that gives details about this and also contact information. Um, and certainly if people know of case studies or, or issues that we, you think might be relevant to this, we encourage you to, to contribute. One of our challenges has been because we need case studies that address issues from both the, you know, the natural, the social and the governing systems, not all, very few places have really embraced that whole um, um, tr trilogy of, of approaches. And so uh, we are finding that it, it's a bit challenging to get case studies, and I think this is another challenge of working in an inter interdisciplinary field. So if you do know of any, please, please do come forward. And then I'm awarding us a tiramisu because we started as an interdisciplinary team and we are working forward as an inter interdisciplinary team. Um, just quickly, uh, we also, within our more traditional frames, need to be innovative. And revisit some of our paradigms and some of our sort of, you know, epistemological ideas. And so the idea of balanced harvesting has emerged uh, two or three times over the last 10 to 20 years. And now it's actually um, gaining some credence, largely through the work of the IUCN Fisheries Expert Group which published a paper in 2012 in Science about reconsidering the consequences of selective fishing, arguing for balanced fishing. So balanced fishing distributes a moderate mortality from fishing across a wide range of species, stocks, and size groups. And the idea is that it can mitigate the adverse effects um, of fishing, maintain eco ecosystem structure, and addresses food security um, better than uh, focusing very on very selective fisheries for, for uh, larger species. Uh, just quickly, theoretically, um, our aquatic food webs are size structured. We have lots of species at the bottom, sorry, lots of small species at the bottom primary produ uh, producers. As we go up that food web, the numbers de size increases, the numbers decrease. Um, and we can turn this on its side, and here we have our, our more commonly uh, seen biomass spectrum, which is uh, if you move from the left to the right, as our size increases, our biomass and abundance decreases. Um, so the idea of balanced harvesting, oh, sorry, and then the distribution, uh, so we have phytoplankton, etc. cetera. Uh, oops, that was the wrong one. Yeah, so we have large fish uh, reproducing, um, so then we have small fish, which then grow uh, to become larger fish. So we have this interaction across the size spectrum. And what fishing does, it takes those larger ones away and it adjusts the, 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 the slope of the biomass size spectrum. The slope becomes steeper, so it changes from here to become steeper and it, it increases the, the intersection point in the biomass. So it changes the structure of the system. And this is just an example from the North Sea, whereas over the green is unfished, then blue is more fished, red is even more fished. This is based on empirical data, I think. Um, and as the fishing increases, the slope gets stronger, higher. So this is indicating how the ecosystem changes as a result of fishing. So the idea of balanced harvesting is that we don't change that slope. We just fish equally across the production of all sizes, all species, and we just reduce the, the size of the system, but we maintain the structure. And there's going to be a morning panel about this tomorrow morning, and I'd encourage you to come and, and share your thoughts on this. Uh, thanks to Yeffi for the slides. Um, Jake Rice will moderate this session. This is an opportunity to start discussing this idea at a much broader level in the science community. And at the moment, I'm awarding this uh, cherry with the uh, cake with the cherry on top because really, really it, currently, this has been a, na a natural science-led problem. We've defined the problem. And we need to bring in a broader community to, to further define the problem, think about the methods to approach it, and certainly the policy solution. And that's going to be the real challenge here. And I hope that we'll get to that discussion tomorrow. Uh, just quickly then, some conclusions. People are at the center of this. We create the problems. We're key to the solutions. I've told you that um, we need scientists from multiple disciplines, stakeholders involved, uh, various appropriate decision making. We need a transdisciplinary approach. We also need a systems thinking approach. We need to be innovative. And we need communication at all levels. I haven't talked about that much here, um, but I think we know that. And I think we can do all this. I think we, it is being done already to a certain extent, and I think we can do more. But there are bigger challenges. Um, I think we need to, to re-explore the, the funding structure of science. Much of the funding structure is still very discipline-bound. 
This is changing with initiatives such as Future Earth and uh, NSF have a coupled natural human uh, assistance program. But these are also very, very competitive funding streams. And I would argue that uh, having a transdisciplinary disciplinary approach needs to be the way that we routinely do our science and not just available to the successful grant winners. We have to rethink how we do our science. Uh, we also need to modify the, the award structure in science. Uh, it was mentioned, I think, yesterday that not, we shouldn't just be judged on the basis of our number of primary publications, but also how many times have we gone out and given uh, to talk with community members, talk with stakeholders, published articles in the press, um, written a cartoon to, to, to explain to people about ocean acidification. We need to do much more to get our message across, and that needs to be recognized uh, in the award system for science. There's also education, and just briefly, uh, this paper I mentioned earlier by Chianelli et al., uh, they propose that for uh, graduate students there should be short training courses where the students work together uh, with students from other disciplines and also with stakeholders on defined problems. And uh, they define the problem in a transdisciplinary way, they share the methods and look at what policy options are available. So they actually get hands-on experience of working in a transdisciplinary setting as part of their research and as part of their uh, training and learning. And then the fourth and biggest challenge I leave to Sherman to tell you about. Um, so Hawthorne the crab, who's a pain in the ass most of the time, he says, despite all our efforts to reduce our carbon emissions, things are still getting worse, which leads me to believe that the problem is bigger than we think. We may have to rely on our political leadership to find the courage to make big changes. And Ernest says, or we could colonize another planet which Hawthorne thinks is more plausible. The point I'm making, of course, here is that much of what we need to do comes down to political will, political leadership. And it's not an option to move to another planet. We have one planet, one ocean. And so we need to find ways to communicate with our policy, our leaders. As it needs to be a bottom-up and a top-down process. Otherwise, we won't get there. And with that, we need to work together. And with that, I, I thank you. And one last word for Sherman's Lagoon. This is not uncommon when you do a social science kind of focused talk to a group of natural scientists. Thank you, Ali. That very, very provoking. A lot of uh, good thoughts in here. And I really appreciate the comment that you say that we have to find another way to reward the scientific community. It is not only a question of publishing papers, mm. but there are many other things that we ha can evaluate and consider as part of the curricula. But how can we make this change? Because this is something that I have uh, heard since, the, let's say, five or ten years ago, but nothing seems to change. Yes. And someone intervened yesterday in the, the side event to basically say the same thing. Here we are 10 years later and we're still saying the same old stuff and have we made any progress? And I agree this is a major challenge. I think, leaving the question of education aside for just a moment, I think we have seen progress, at least in my career, in terms of the integration of the human and natural sciences. That is happening more. I think there are more interdisciplinary courses at universities. And apparently there is, um, I've forgotten the name of it, there's a university on the west coast of the States where they offer this kind of integrated training course. So it is happening, but it's happening slowly. So I think the question is how can we ha make it happen more quickly? And I think some of the capacity building initiatives that, that um, Mike mentioned yesterday in terms of IMBER, that's part of it, but that's only a very small step towards where we need to go. So I mean, one way is for all the people here who come from academic institutions, for example, to bring this message home to your institutions and, and, and provide the reasons why. And again, I think this needs to be more of a bottom-up thing where scientists, researchers, academics need to go back and say, we need to start developing these courses. And you know, I, I don't know what else to say, Luis. It's, it's, it's a big challenge, but I think we can't just keep saying, well, this is up to someone else to do. We need to start taking initiative. 
Aleta, thank you very much for a thought-provoking talk. Two questions I'll give you an opportunity to speak more on. You presented the issue of scale in the context of data availability, where it really is a challenge. But certainly in the IUCN Fishery Expert Group, where we do have a mix of social and natural scientists, there's been a real dynamic tension that to the social scientists, the scale that is natural to study is the community and the local scale. And to the ecological scientists, it's the large marine ecosystem type of scale. So there's an inherent incompatibility yeah. of meaningful scales to study. And I'd be interested in your perspective on that. The other question that you might want to speak to, I thought your presentation of Murray Rudd's results was very interesting and the fact that you have different priorities for the physical and ecological scientists than the, natural, than the social scientists. Is that a problem that needs to be fixed or is that a reality that we simply need to build on? Yeah. I'll answer your second question first and would also encourage you to go to Murray's talk and ask him the same question. I, I, think, it's, I think it's actually a strength that we need to build from. I, th I think it's not a question of one or the other, but to use both, both sets of priorities as a means to move forward. And you know whether a research question is number one or five on the list, I don't think that matters. I think identifying those that we can work on now and start to work together on, that's what's key. Coming back to the first question about differences of scale, this is an incredible challenge, but I think it comes back to the point that Patrick Christie made in his five dilemmas, that we need to think both globally and locally, and we know that phrase, right, think global, act local. Um, but that's very much the case, particularly with the social sciences, because a lot of the larger scale stuff doesn't really mean much at the human level. And if we're putting humans at the center of what we do, that means it's both at the individual level, the community level, the national level. So we don't need to think it across multiple scales and work to find ways to, to integrate across those scales. Now, that's not really a very good answer in the sense of saying this is what we can go and do now, but it's recognition that we need to work it across scales and, bo and bring the, the information from both sciences together. Um, and so we need... Um, like the, the examples of the two projects I, I mentioned where we've tried to do the interdisciplinary work are, are basically large-scale projects. We're looking big global in reach. But at the same time, there's lots of really great work going on at a much smaller focused scale. And this is one of the differences, too, between the natural and social sciences. We have, you know, like OBIS and all these other data collection systems to collect all these different data points from the natural sciences. But we don't have, a, at least not that I'm aware of, a parallel... Uh, opportunity to collect the social science data and there is a lot of great data out there but how do we bring it all together and that's I think that's a data management challenge which I'd throw out there okay <coughs> uh, hi Alida thanks for your presentation and um, um, and under the ecosystem approach to fisheries in FAO, we are doing a lot of practical work working with the um, uh, stakeholders and institutions um, in, in a number of developing countries to implement these integrated approaches to fisheries management. So lo really looking at uh, um, uh, ecosystem as, as systems, uh, looking both at the human and, um, and the natural part of, of the systems. Um, and in, in terms of, we have developed also similar, uh, um, you know, like the Imber Adapt, uh, we do have methodologies for um, um, assessing the system in an integrated way, at the same time um, um, establishing uh, uh, processes at the institutional level for planning and manage, uh, managing in a more integrated way. Uh, one of the key challenges that uh, personally I feel we are meeting um, in, in relation to the science and the knowledge to underpin this process is, is really um, the methodologies to um, look at these systems in an integrated way and in a data poor situation. So, so I feel that uh, doing, uh, well, the kind of meta-analysis work is, is really interesting. It gives you a, an overview or goes on at the global level. But at the local level, we do need support with methodologies for decision making. Um, um, yeah, at the local level for practical management purposes. Uh, that's where we feel uh, we're really missing. And 
And again, particularly with focus on data poor situations, because we can't wait to get the best science and data we have to manage today to address the key priority problems. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And thank you for making that point, Gabriella. And so part of our initiative for trying to develop the Zimba ADAPT framework is to exactly enable in data poor situations where the data may not be there to make a, you know, to, to do the kind of assessment one would ideally do, but perhaps there are lessons from other places that can be uh, applied more quickly and, and, and therefore enable a, a, a more rapid, but more informed response too. Um, but I'd, I'd be interested to chat with you after too about whether there's many, perhaps some of the case studies that you've mentioned could be, uh, we could bring into this framework. That would be really useful. Thank you. Last question over there. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Eric Sattler with C Semester and um, really got a lot of great ideas out of your talk this morning. To use your biomass analogy, I would argue that we really need to start teaching this at the undergraduate level, not wait till they're graduate students. <laughs> So that by the time they trickle up to this level and are sitting in a room like this, they already have the skills to talk to each other as opposed to having to learn them after the fact, after they've been, they've been pigeonholed into disciplines like we have. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts on how we can start doing that at the undergraduate level. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with you. But at the same time, the, there are quite a few courses, certainly in, in North America and Europe, where they have interdisciplinary courses at the undergraduate level. Um, one of the arguments against them is always that it's better to have a good grounding in one discipline, and then as you go through graduate school, to, to bring in you know, information from other disciplines and become more interdisciplinary as you proceed forwards. Um, I think there is scope to do what you suggest. And I think that, that, as I say, that's already happening in, in, in some places. But I, I don't think that, that students are too pigeonholed by the time they get to graduate school. Um, no, I, I, I can't agree with that, 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 that observation. Uh, and I would suggest we need to do both, both quite frankly. I, I think undergraduates, certainly undergraduates in science, should be exposed to the philosophy of science, history of science, um, sociology of science, understanding its broader implications, its context in society, understand the, the, the sort of epistemological processes of how they learn their knowledge, the paradigms they work under, et cetera. I think that is key to the undergraduate scale. And then certainly um, at, at the graduate level, branching that out into a more sort of transdisciplinary approach. So it is happening a bit, but not as much as we need it to. Thank you for your question. This panel will be led by uh, Jane Lubchenko, who gave our, our wonderful opening plenary talk. And the panelists are Alan Simcock, World Ocean Assessment, Carol Turley, Plymouth Marine Laboratory, Niall McDonald, European Marine Board, and David Van der Zwag, Dalhousie University, Canada. <laughs>